You are listening to Faithless Brewing, a Magic the Gathering podcast for the Spike Rogue. Each week we design new decks for tournament play. We put our creations to the test and share our findings on the air. Hideaway is back and weirder than ever. Today on the Brew Session, we look at Fight Rigging, a card that has scored some of the craziest 5-0s in recent memory. We've got new Fight Rigging brews in Pioneer, plus testing with Ginny Fay in Modern. That's all coming up on Faithless Brewing. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show! Welcome to the Faithless Brewing Podcast. I am David Robertson coming to you live from the Twin Cities, and I am joined by the CEO of the Faithless Brewing Podcast. He is Cave Dan Online, Daniel Schriever. What is going on, my friend? I'm doing well, David. Good to see you again. Welcome back. Yeah, great to be here. Um, what's new? Uh, just melting a little bit. It was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, only 90 feels like 98 or whatever in north carolina it's it's that time of year yeah it's supposed to be 101 degrees in minnesota on monday so it went from a very cold like a historically cold april to a freakishly (laughs) hot summer all of a sudden there was really no spring (laughs) it was glorious though (laughs) the two days that were (laughs) spring-like winter gave spring a miss and went straight on into (laughs) summer and climate change well, it's the end of days, all right, but, you know, we have to brew through it. That's kind of the uh, the only way to survive. <laughs> yeah. So we have a bunch of stuff to talk about today, but before we get into looking at new cards, looking at uh, our card from last week, which was the voter's card, Ginny Fay, Jetmere Second, we need to do a little housekeeping at the top. And that is, first of all, to welcome our two newest patrons. They are Dylan J and Tuan Tuan. Welcome to both of you. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution. And uh, yeah, welcome on board the uh, Faithless Brewing Brew Train. Yeah, thank you very much. And welcome to the Faithless family. If you're a fan of the show and want to support what we do here at the podcast, Patreon is the best way to do so. You can make a pledge at any tier you like. That can be a dollar a show. You get access to our Discord channel. We've got an awesome community there of crazy brewers. You've got other perks as well. If you are interested in merch, we've got tokens, we've got playmats. All of that you can find at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing. Also got other stuff in the works. We've launched a YouTube channel recently. I've been putting our podcast there and also been working on getting some gameplay up so that if you want to follow along as we're talking about the list we tested and just want to see how they actually performed, uh, you can find those videos now on YouTube as well. Uh, I'm going to be talking about some Genie Fey decks today, and I believe I should have the League gameplay up by the time this episode goes live. I've got a spicy one. It's got a, it's got a lot of gingerbread cabins, I'll, I'll put it that way. <laughs> I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of went nuts on gingerbread cabins. <laughs> Very food-themed week for me. Yeah. So yeah, check out the YouTube channel. Leave us a comment. Let us know like how we can improve the format. We're just getting started with that, so any feedback helps. We really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. And it can be feedback directly in the YouTube uh, video itself, or you can obviously message us here at Faithless Brewing, or you can go to uh, Faithless Brewing on Twitter and uh, you know write angry tweets at uh, Dan, and he loves responding to those. Well, put it in a YouTube video, positive or negative, put it in the comments so that the algorithm is like, this is the hot stuff. I'm gonna keep showing this to people. Goddamn algorithm. <laughs> so, a um, little news this week. Uh, I mean, it's kind of the summer doldrums, but we are on the brink of yet another Master Set, Double Masters 2022. I think the previews will have started by the time you're listening to this. Red Ant 6 is in there. I guess the only thing I'm wondering about is like how much MH2 stuff will be in there, if any. Yeah, and I mean, we've seen, right, like way back when Tarmogoyf was one of the better two drops, you know, the, the thought was in one of the Modern Master sets is that this 
Tarmogoyf reprint was going to make it cheaper. In fact, it ended up raising the price, uh, ironically. So there's no guarantee that uh, this will lower the price of Renin 6. There's no guarantee that Renin 6 will not get banned. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we are not a financial podcast. We are not making any recommendations at this time. <laughs> Other news, Magic is apparently turning 30 years old. That's kind of, <laughs> it hurts to say this. <laughs> because I was alive when Magic came out, and it follows that I'm older than 30 years old. And it's, uh, it's a bit much to, if I follow that train of thought to its logical conclusion, it's not good, David. It's even funnier when you look back and watch, like, I don't know, sitcoms or whatever, and you realize you're just older than everyone is meant to be. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, like, some of the actors were older or whatever, but when you watch, like, Seinfeld, you know, I went from watching it when I was much younger than the principals, and like, oh, that's how 30-somethings would act. And now I'm, like, probably a decade, you know, I'm 40. I'm a decade older than, than especially in the early seasons. I think the, the multiple cast members are meant to be in their late 20s. Uh, so it's just like, man, this is uh, <laughs> quite the twist. <laughs> My wife and I watch watch a lot of Friends on HBO, and <laughs> that's, it's that same feeling. Like, I used to be able to check, at least am I doing better than Chandler Bing? And for a long time, I was like, okay, I'm, at least I'm okay. <laughs> My life and Chandler's life are parallel comparable at best but now it's like oh geez you know <laughs> although ironically if they just like bought that apartment they lived in they would be multi-millionaires by now <laughs> they would have never had to work <laughs> <laughs> like the with the i don't know where they are they meant to be living in manhattan i believe so right above the central perk so that loft is worth like six million dollars or whatever i mean <laughs> yeah so there's a party coming up in vegas the 30th anniversary celebration um you tempted it all no. <laughs> You're talking to someone who went to not my 30th, but someone else's 30th. And the conclusion after we did, I won't uh, name any of the illicit substances, was like, we were getting way too old for this kind of stuff. I think the magic one will be like that too. It's like, oh, actually, we uh, party too hard the first night. We can't really go out the second <laughs> night. You know, uh, cocaine is a younger man's drug. And, you know, multiple women at the club were like doing drugs I'd never heard of and like thought it was hilarious. I was drinking like whiskey and Coke, like, Oh, old school. Like, yep. This is like reality is harsh <laughs> in the face of, uh, there are back-to-back -back parties planned at this thing. So you can book in advance, get your VIP pass. It's interesting. Like reading the announcement details were sparse at best, but they didn't put much emphasis on playing magic. It was not even clear to me that there was a tournament. Like they mentioned that, there is a modern event, top eight of which becomes a beta draft. So obviously that's like the headline grabbing thing. Like, wouldn't that be so sweet to be in this modern event that feeds a beta draft? What's the best uh, common in beta? Is it like pestilence? Oh, well, in draft, I mean, the last beta drafts that I recall were from the Magic 25 <laughs> from the Magic 25th anniversary, which was like last year, although the math doesn't add up on that since apparently it's his 30th anniversary. <laughs> Where is the time gone? Yeah, it seemed like that people were struggling to find any playable deck. I imagine like Disintegrate and Fireball would be some of the better cards, but yeah, Pestilence is just absolutely broken. Yeah, maybe we'll do a beta draft breakdown if uh, anyone in our Discord is thinking of making a run. <laughs> I know that some people in our Discord are like getting their travel plans in order. The assumption is that this is going to be a sweet event, um, although they haven't said enough about it to like make me feel like I understand what it is. If you're a true drafter, do you like take pestilence over off-color mocks because you're really trying to win, or like that's like a Ben Stark move? <laughs> 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 you remember how all the pros got enraged when that guy uh, money drafted like a Tarmogoyf over like a shock variant or something? I feel like that that would be the ultimate baller move, like pass. The off-color mocks. <laughs> Draft. <laughs> Draft terror. <laughs> Goyf Gate, the, the foil Tarmogoyf that was yeah. money drafted in top eight of a Grand Prix. We'll probably get a foil uh, Ren and Six money draft at some point here with the uh, new <laughs> Modern Masters. Yeah, so a lot to look forward to. Never a dull moment in the world of Magic the Gathering. Even as we enter our fourth decade. All right, uh, enough about that. Let's get some brewing. Let's talk about some new cards. So our new card of this week is one that 
I was a pretty skeptical of. You mentioned this to me a couple of weeks ago as like a card that you thought was kind of interesting. I didn't believe you, but <laughs> it seems like you were right and I was wrong, at least to the extent that, you know, we're talking about it right now. <laughs> Which might be more of a function of the fact that there aren't that many <laughs> super powerful cards in this set to continue brewing around, but, you know, I will take uh, even Pyrrhic Victory at times. <laughs> you sent me a list, a Sultai list, which is one of the ones we're going to talk about. I assumed that you were, like, the only person playing with this card, but it turns out there's, like, three or four different 5-0 lists in Pioneer, and they're all, like, crazy different. So we're going to get a chance to take a look at all those and dig into this card. But... First, we should figure out what's going on. What does this card do? Tell us about Fight Rigging. Yeah, so Fight Rigging is part of a cycle. Each color had uh, one of these enchantments. They all have Hideaway 5. That's the thing that is consistent. The rest of the card is... Uh, the thing that turns it on is different for each of the colors. So green is the, the creature color. Green is the one that triggers on big creatures. So green is the two and a green enchantment, Hideaway 5. So that means when it comes into play, you look at your top five cards, you pick one of them, you exile it face down. Um, and then at the beginning of combat on your turn, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. Then if you control a creature with power seven or greater, you may play the exiled card without paying its mana cost. So one of the things we talked about during spoiler season was, is the power of this card in the, the hideaway, the free card? Or can you get some use out of the uh, the trigger that happens? They all have a, a, a semi-useful effect that happens. We highlighted a deck a couple weeks ago, Dan, that was playing Fight Rigging super fair. They had very few cards they wanted to cheat and play, and they were just taking advantage of that plus one, plus one counter a turn is not playable on its own, but it's close to playable. And that's actually pretty good if you can pair it with, you know, eventually replacing itself and possibly and possibly gaining mana. Yeah, that was like a mono green list. Had the Nykthos Devotion Core, which has turned out to be like one of the best decks in the first set of results after Expressive Iteration and Winota had been banned. So before getting into decks specifically, let's just make sure we understand exactly what's happening with the card. Hideaway is a familiar mechanic if you've played Shelldock Isle, that's probably the most well-known Hideaway card. The Hideaway mechanic no longer includes the Come to Play Tapped Clause. So if it matters, your fight rigging comes into play untapped if you're doing some sort of Starfield of Nyx thing. Do all those cards still come into play tapped? They've just added that as text to the card itself? Correct. Yeah. Okay. They just added an extra line of text. Even poor Watcher for Tomorrow. All right. Well. <laughs> Got errata. Still it comes into play tapped. So this one has a bigger hideaway number, comes in play untapped. The important thing is just making sure that you understand exactly how to unlock the hideaway card. And in the case of fight rigging, the plus one plus one counter ability is all one big continuous trigger. So you have to target your creature first. When the ability resolves, you put the counter on and then it checks to see do you have anything seven or greater. If so, you get to play the card. If they manage to like kill your creature you targeted in response to the fight rigging trigger, that actually fizzles the entire ability because it was a single target effect. However, uh, the creature that gets you to seven does not have to be the one that you targeted. So if you have like multiple, well, who knows? This is not going to come up. <laughs> this will like literally never happen. <laughs> but in theory, you could trigger the fight rigging off a different creature while distributing a counter to something else. Yeah, I've done that multiple times. Targeted my Sylvan carry added uh, because I already have a seven power on creature in play. Because I want the ability to resolve, and if they kill the creature before combat, that's actually going to alter uh, what I'm going to do, or the other creatures I'm going to attack with. But, like, strategically, did that actually help you? Because, like, if they killed the creature that you were not targeting, you still wouldn't have had a 7-power creature anyway. So you just got a free counter on the carry attack, basically? Yeah, and, and I had um, the ability to sack a fetch land to pump my, um, my uh, mammoth. Oh, I see. Interesting. But I did not want to. I did not want to pop it then. I wanted to threaten lethal, but I needed to keep it in reserve for like multiple attacks for the, for the turn it was going to get through. Interesting. Uh, specifically resolving the trigger, playing a card without paying its mana cost. Uh, we basically understand how this type of thing works. So all in all, a pretty straightforward card. I guess the bigger questions are like: Is this card even remotely playable? 
and I still lean towards no, but evidence is building that I could be wrong. First of all, I gotta ask you, David, like in terms of power level, are we talking pioneer only, or do you think this has a chance in a, a format like modern? Yeah, I think I think pioneer only. Even in pioneer, I think it's a somewhat speculative card. Uh, we know that a plus one plus one counter every turn in even with upside is not that good. Uh, if you look at Hydana's Climb, which is a card you've highlighted, which is another three mana card, it adds plus one plus one every turn. That actually t flips into mana with like sort of a berserk like ability triggered to the land, which is quite powerful. Um, that sees no play. That that barely saw play in standard. There there was a few uh, you know weeks where there were some cool Hydana's Climb lists. So um, I don't think just the plus one plus one counter by itself matters. I don't think just the flip trigger matters, but I think both of them together do combine into something that, uh, that leads to something interesting because you have the explosive ability to get the free card, but then if they kind of sell out to stop the explosive ability, getting plus one plus one counters every turn does mean that you win like creature stalemates and stuff. So especially after Winota is gone, this felt like a thing that you could do. Hmm. So getting a plus one, plus one counter every turn, is it fair to call that like the fail state of fight rigging? Yeah, it, important to note, you get it that first turn. That makes a lot bigger difference than you'd think. Uh, it allows you to often attack, right? So it, it can mean the difference instead of like zero damage, you get to do four damage or something like that. Just pumping a three power creature so it gets to attack into Omnath, for instance. I'm just making up a scenario. Um, so we, we've seen over and over again that cards that trigger that first combat they come into play are way more powerful than we think. Uh, you have Luminarch Aspirin highlighted here. Uh, I've been having a ton of success with that card, uh, tweaking out my, the Esper Hate Bears list that we talked about uh, during Rafine Week. Um, and just Aspirin coming down, pumping up a one uh, mana creature is just so tempo positive. And now you have a three power creature, right? And Aspirin, what do they kill? You know, you, you, it just happens so much quicker than I think people realize. So Aspirin ended up being much better than we thought. And I think most people thought when it was printed. And this card has the same kind of uh, ability. Next question. When you look at a card like Fight Rigging, are you thinking, I want to go as big as possible? Playing a card without paying its mana cost, should I just be picking the biggest thing in the format? Omniscience, Ubermog, etc. Or are you thinking, you know, I, I don't want to go that big. I just want to build like a normal deck where I occasionally get something nice off this. Yeah, I, I hate cards that are, like, all in in that way. I have seen people build it, especially I think the, the reason that this card has been seeing more play in Pioneer is because there are people experimenting a lot in Explorer, uh, specifically uh, Gabriel Nassif, the Hall of Fame French player, who is, you know, one of the more popular streamers. Um, I think once, unfortunately, people really need to see, like, proof of concept that something can be done, and then once they see that it can be done, then they are more willing to try it. Um but yeah, I, I, there have been builds that, you know, are ca trying to cast ultimatum or whatever. But the problem is you need a density enough of them that you are likely to hit it in your top five. Then you still need to have a bunch of the seven power creatures. So um, for me, I don't like going all in. Uh, I think you're asking for way too many things to go right. I like this card to be more or less part of the normal plan. Um, and then... You know, if everything goes really right, sure, you have some nut draws, but I don't think even a nut draw is that good, right? Like, e even if you hit whatever 10 mana permanent, unless it's, like, specifically Ulamog or whatever, but then your deck can't cast it. So if you don't hit it, like, every time you draw these cards, what are you, you going to do with them, right? If you have some kind of looting effect or whatever, I mean, you, you need to have a plan for when you draw the, the 10 mana, the 12 mana, the 15 mana card that, that uh, you're hoping to cast for free. What, what are you doing if it's put in your hand? Yeah, important to remember that fight rigging, it's not like it allows you to play anything for free. It allows you to play the hidden away card, and the hidden away card was whatever was in your top five. So you could build the perfect deck, go through all the hoops to enable fight rigging, and it turns out that your top five cards only had like, I don't know, like a growth spiral or something. <laughs> through no fault of yours, it just like came up that way. So if you're not going to go out of your way to stack the top of the deck, you have to just be okay with the fight rigging just taking a card from your deck. Yeah, so I think creatures are just like much more reasonable to play in Pioneer, but the stacking your deck ability is obviously much greater in Modern. So that's the one way where, you know, can you discard an Emrakul or something and then put it on top? You know, we've had at various points, Brainstone, these kind of cards. Um, do you have enough time to like fart around with all that and then still get your, you know, six plus power creature into play to be targeted by fight rigging? 
I'm not so sure about that. Uh, and, and the reality is you can just build your deck around playing a six mana creature, which is called Primeval Titan, and you don't need to play Fight Rigging at all, and you don't ever have to get lucky with your top five cards. Your entire deck is made to win once Primeval Titan resolves. Um, and people have been doing that, right, for, since uh, Primeval Titan, uh, specifically Valakit, got on ban. So um, I just think the payoffs maybe aren't there, and to, to get enough of a payoff to really bend the control of the top of your deck involves making the rest of your deck quite, quite a bit worse. Primeval Titan does have six powers. So if I had it in play, yeah. and I had a fight rigging, yeah, you see what I'm seeing. You could cast <laughs> the, another Primeval Titan <laughs> for free. So all that being said, like, how are we actually going to get the trigger to happen? What are some of the best creatures that will allow me to unlock the Hidden Away card? So as usual with cards like this, Wizards kind of came with a pre-built uh, quote-unquote combo, which is Shakedown Heavy. You know, two and a black for a 6-4 creature with a very punishing negative ability. But it does naturally, you know, you play Shakedown Heavy on 3, you play Fight Rigging on 4. Um, you get your 7 power that way. We have experimented. I think we even had a Routing Registrar week. Uh, you know, we highlighted as best in class 7 power already um, for 3 mana. These cards are both hittable with Collected Company, right? So Collected Company is also a fine card to play for free if you have Fight Rigging. So I think that was kind of the initial build I think a lot of people had, right? Is a bunch of nice three drops. Obviously, Mana Elf is one of the best turn ones in the format, as we see that Mono Green is very good. Winota before it was, was apparently bannable. That already is just a, a reasonable core because hitting Coco uh, at the start of combat is great. Cocoing on your end step and hitting multiple six or seven power creatures is great. And you can see that you aren't playing too many cards that are requiring, uh, you know, too much crazy stuff to be in your deck. Shakedown Heavy from Streets of Nukapenna, two and a black, six four menace, Ogre Warrior. Whenever Shakedown Heavy attacks, defending player may choose to have you draw a card so they can get shaken down, surrender their card to you. And if that happens, you untap the Shakedown Heavy, you take it out of combat. So it's a great blocker. As an attacker, it's like weirdly a card draw engine slash punisher mechanic. So you describe this as like a very bad card. I see it in a lot of lists, like in standard with Flight Rigging. Is this a bad card? Yeah, it's it's a bad card, um, but it's you have I think you have to play it to have a, a density of effects. It is the best card to play with Flight Rigging other than Rotting Regisaur. Uh, if if you're willing to splash into black, you should play it because fight rigging and it are so good. But yeah, Punisher mechanics, the card is always worse than it looks. The opponent can take the damage when they don't want to. They can untap it when they choose to. They just have a ton of control about how much damage they're going to take. They can give you cards, you know, the control that can give you a bunch of cards once they have their counter magic up. Um, you can't control how much you pressure them into sweepers you have to play other creatures so then their sweeper is always a two for one so they get that card back right away uh yeah it's 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 a very very limited card it, it sucks in races mm. you can't race spirits easily it has a lot of negatives to it okay have you seen it played in any list without fight rigging mm. <laughs> so that that tells you right it, it has to be played with a card that it's it's turning on your three mana card that already has a little bit of value every turn, it's it's basically casting another card for free, and that's the only way that it's that it's playable. One thing that seems really attractive with fight rigging is a six power creature that has protection. Hexproof or even ward would do the trick. And there are actually two different creatures that meet that criterion. They're six six for four. One of them is Nullhide Ferox, the other is Reservoir Kraken. Reservoir Kraken. I'm sure we skipped this card during previews. Two blue blue, Kraken, 6-6, six, six, Trample, and Ward 2. So a good amount of protection on the Reservoir Kraken, but it also has that Punisher mechanic. It says at the beginning of each combat, if the Kraken is untapped, an opponent may tap an untapped creature they control. If they do so, you get to make a fish token, but then you have to tap the Kraken. Nullhide Ferox, uh, a card that you've suggested in like a discard heavy metagame before, is really interesting because it says that you cannot play non-creature spells. So if you're putting that in your fight rigging deck, you have to play the fight rigging first before the Ferox. Or you can pay mana to to not have its ability function. Oh, I forgot about that actually. I totally forgot that was a thing. So for two mana, you can turn off that ability, but that also turns off hexproof. 
Yeah, so you kind of have the natural curve of three mana fight rigging into four mana null hide ferox, or let's say your three mana fight rigging gets countered, you play four mana null hide ferox into five mana fight rigging, where I pay the extra two to turn off the null hide ferox. The problem is when you do that curve, that four to five curve, the only reason you're playing this null hide ferox, which is not typically thought of as a pioneer play, or excuse me, a constructive playable card, is the hex proof. And you've turned off that hex proof <laughs> so you can play your fight rigging. Um, and yeah, that, then there's no reason to be playing Nullhide Ferox in your deck. Okay, so are you tempted by either Nullhide Ferox or Reservoir Kraken? I mean, tempted, I think these are reasonable cards to consider. The thing is, I think Shakedown Heavy and Rotting Registrar are just so natural. If I'm going to add a second color, black is better than blue because it's much more interactive. And I think the cyborg cards are better. And then again, these cards are all hittable by Collected Company, which I think... Um, you know, is maybe a natural addition if if you're playing a bunch of just beat down creatures right in your in your plus one plus one counter deck. Null Hide Ferox is a little closer. I don't think right now the way the format is set up, it actually interacts that well. Um, but it, it's certainly a possibility. Hmm. You then you really don't want to play any other hits though. You don't want to play Collected Company in that list. You don't want to play Great Henge, which is a card that I really liked in uh, the the Fight Ring list that I, I uh, built that we'll talk about. So your all your hits have to be creatures at that point. Any other giant six or maybe five power creatures that you think we should be aware of? So the the key card I found that I haven't not seen that many other people playing with is Kazandu Mammoth, which is like a hidden seven power creature if you play Fable Passage. Hmm. And and even without it's functionally a five power creature if you have a land drop. So it, it can actually get there pretty quick. And you want to play a bunch of mana sources anyway, but it's also a hidden creature. So yeah, I, I, I was super impressed with Kazandu Mammoth. That, that's a card I think people should, uh, should be considering. That didn't even make it onto my list when I was researching because I did not bother searching for any three power creatures. It doesn't even matter if the Fable Passage is tapped or untapped, right? You just need two landfall triggers. Yep, exactly. Okay. Although typically, if you could play the Mammoth the following turn, unless they, whatever, you played it with a mana ramp creature or something, um, you'll, it'll typically come into play on tap. But it, yeah, it does not need to. You, can, you could, if you chose to go Mana Elf, Mammoth, turn three fight rigging, uh, fetch land, and you, uh, you meet the requirements. So I'm just going to rattle off some creatures. You can tell me if any of them pique your interest. Croxa, Titan of Death Hunger. Mana is too hard, I'm guessing. In Pioneer especially. Also, Kroxa is typically not actually in play at the beginning of combat uh, early in the game. You know, this, okay. is, this is a grindy attrition card. It kind of has the card advantage built in that you're trying to gain with your hideaway card. I, I, don't, I don't think these cards go to, in the same deck. Big green six drops. Tovalar's Huntmaster from Winota. But I noticed that Averbrook Caretaker was actually in some old Winota lists. And that also has Hexproof. Yeah, I think you really want to find a way where you're getting more power than mana. Uh, at six mana, there's a lot of cards that are just super powerful. I don't know that you want to be playing six power creatures, right? How much are you cheating on your, your hideaway card at that point? If you're like, you just resolve the six drop. So what are you, are you playing another seven drop on top of that? I, I think that's, you know, <laughs> all the stuff you're, you're going to want to happen pretty fast. So I think you really want to look at four or three mana plays. And then if you can find something, you know, Great Hinge is a card that I think a lot of people, including myself, identified, where it's a great hit, it's a very powerful effect, but in my deck with a bunch of high power creatures, it can be played for very cheap. So it's not like it's stranded in my hand if I don't have the fight rigging. So you, you need to find stuff like that, that, that kind of, you know, splits the difference. Okay. Um, in terms of payoffs, then... So we know we need a creature that we can get up to seven power, but like, what are we hoping to get paid off with? Right? We have already talked about maybe we shouldn't have anything big. Maybe we should only be playing cards that we can cast without fight rigging. But are there specific cards that like stand out among the payoffs? I mean, the card that first made me want to build this list, and the reason why the list that I sent to you was Sultai, is because I really, really love Valky. Uh, you and I have had a ton of success building like Salt I Bring to Light Valky lists, Four Color Omnath Bring to Light Valky lists. I built that super cool like uh, alteration of Ekaros' list that was like a Luris list that had Bring to Light for Valky. 
with um, a bunch of sack creatures and we took massacre that was an awesome list i think i four one with so i more than almost anybody in pioneer you know we've found cool ways to put valky in play and this seemed like a natural home for it because valky is an awesome card to hit it's a card you can play just on turn two if you want to play a more controlling build um and i was actually interested in the card Release to the Wind, which is great with Valky, but it also resets your, your hideaway card. So if you don't have a good hit, you just cast it again. <laughs> Why not? Okay. Release to the Wind. Blinks any kind of permanent, even enchantments. So yeah. they thought of everything when they designed that card. Someone's going to want to blink their hideaway enchantment. <laughs> Today is finally that day. Yeah, the other card that came to mind for me was thinking along the lines of Valky and double face cards. Turn Timber Symbiosis seems like, you know, a reasonably valuable payoff that I can put into my deck at almost no cost. Almost. And then I just have, like, a little more chance of my top five cards getting something really impactful. If I want to be really frisky, I could try the blue one too. Seagate Restoration, or maybe even the white one. Amiria's Call. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and again, so those conditional things... Sometimes you're just going to play those as mana, that's fine. And sometimes you're going to get uh, something sweet out of them. That, that, those are perfect examples of things that are, never get stuck in your hand. In terms of other synergies, there's probably not much to do with the fact that fight rigging is an enchantment, but distributing plus one plus one counters, I mean, there's a million cards that deal <laughs> in that business. You could probably find a selection of cards that like actually actively want to receive plus one plus one counters. Fight rigging is not fast enough to like make it worth it for that alone, but if you could come up with a deck that you know is built around a plus one plus one counter theme and can actually enable fight rigging in a reasonable you know timely fashion, it might have a home there as well. Yeah, absolutely. All right, deck lists. What do you got for me? All right, so like I said, I really was interested in playing like a more mid-range version that allowed us to go over the top. So I wanted to play four push, four thoughtsies. So I'm playing no mana elves. Uh, my two drops are Valky and Sylvan Carry Added. Carry Added helps us with our mana. Um, it also just is a home to get pumped if that ends up mattering with your... Um, <laughs> I've gotten up to five power, I think. Uh, I've never gotten up to seven. <laughs> um, and then our three drops. For Fight Rigging, for Shakedown Heavy, for Rotting Regisaur, for Kazandu Mammoth, three Release to the Wind, and then our like other hits are three Great Henge, one Turn Timber a Symbiosis. So I had sent kind of a fledgling version of this list to you. You're like, I don't really believe in that. I played it as a proof of concept to a 3-2. Uh, literally got not drawn by Spirits. I was going to kill them. They Coco into... Um, Two of the, what's the one white, white exile uh, card with permanent four or less? Skyclave Apparition. Yeah, so they Coco into two Skyclave Apparitions to kill my two attackers. I play a blocker with, um, I already had uh, the backside of Valky in play. Then they Coco again on their next turn and hit another Skyclave to kill my blocker and then kill Valky and, and then kill me. And, of course, I have to look up, like, how many <laughs> Skyclave Apparitions are these Bant Spiritsless playing? I don't remember them playing any. They're playing three exactly, so they, <laughs> they, the chances of this happening are preposterous. <laughs> so it should have been a 4-1. The deck actually felt great, is, I guess, what the point I'm making. And that initial build was the same core, or was there something fundamentally different about it? It was exactly this list. How were you able to like keep up with a deck like Spirits? I mean, I know you ultimately lost that game, but just looking at your list, you don't have much in the way of defenses. You have the Fatal Pushes, and then if you can get the Valky down, you can, you can use that. Well, a few things. One, a Rotting Registrar races Spirits quite easily if they don't have removal. And except for these random people who've chosen to start playing some cards that do something, they don't have much removal. Two, flipping Valky is very difficult for spirits to deal with, if you can do it. Obviously, that's the difficult part. So I do, I do take out like the release to the winds after board because they have the ability to, you know, counterspell with their one their one drop spirit. But I mean, you just race them, and if you get a henge in play, which their counterspells can't interact with, you just start drawing a ton of cards and you start gaining life every turn. So you don't need to hold them off forever. They need to hold you off at a certain point. 
Yeah, and so that's what was happening is they like to hold up counter magic, right? But like I have a rotting register in play. Like you can keep attacking me through two and three power spirits. You have to tap out in your turn to either present a, a block or something. And you know, as soon as they did, I got to resolve my flip Valky. It just that they just hit the nuts, collected company, and and you know. But I mean, in both games, they just had to hit like runner, runner, runner to to stop what was an overwhelming board position. Did you find that release of the winds was worth a card? Looking for synergies, you've got the four Valkyries, so you can hard cast Velky, cast Release of the Winds, get your Tybalt. You can also blink a Fight Rigging if you need to reuse it, but beyond that, like, there's no synergy between Release of the Winds and the rest of the deck. Yeah, I agree. The only other thing that it does, which I did do once, but I'm not saying this is why you play the card, is if you have Henge in play, Release of the Wind actually triggers it again, so it, it cycles. <laughs> hmm. But... Yeah, it's really just to keep all your nut draws. Like, the format is, again, still super fast. The bands didn't really change the format that much. Like, I, I just had openings where you thought sees Valky, Release to the Wind. Like, you just don't lose those games. It's, it's almost impossible. Um, so it just leaves you out. So, like, I, I always talk about the opening, like, three or four or five turns, you know. And if you can sculpt a reasonable, like, there's no magical Christmas land happening there. That just wins games. There's nothing your opponent can do about that almost. So having the possibility of doing that in addition to the like turn three fight rigging, turn four creature flip or whatever. Um, I just wanted other nut draw-ish opening possibilities. And the mana isn't that punishing. And I was going to play Fable Passage anyway because I think it's so good with Kazandu Mammoth. So if I'm only playing one blue card and it's only a single blue, it's a relatively easy splash. Was my reasoning. Okay, so Release of the Winds is your only blue card here. Yeah, I was curious not to see Bring to Light in the list, and I was thinking Bring to Light's got to be better than Release of the Winds, right? If we're just trying to get Tybalt in play. But that is a much slower sequence. That's turn five, maybe turn four with the Curious Wind. Well, I remember, bring, bring to Light was in my original build, and I realized it cannot be usefully cast off of Fight Rigging. Hmm. So it's not, it's not a hit, right? You don't, you don't spend any mana, so Bring to Light can't find anything. Whereas release to the wind off of fight rigging at very least just gives you another crack at the apple, right? If you, ha if you have a seven power creature in the turn this turn, you're probably going to have one next turn. So release to the wind just resets fight rigging. You try to find your Valky or Great Henge or whatever uh, for your next turn. And that came up multiple times. Interesting. So let me compare this list to the kind of standard collected company build. So this list was played to a 5-0 in late May by Super Cow 12653. Elvish Mystic, Lenore Elves, no surprises there. A bunch of powerful three drops, Old Growth Troll, Shakedown Heavy, Rotting Registor, Steel Leaf Champion. So our collected companies, which we're playing four of, have a good chance of like adding a lot of power to the board. Three Great Henge, four collected company, and finally four Werewolf Pack Leader, a card that you described very nicely, David, how that's like the hidden enabler for the fight rigging pack leader on two fight rigging on three by the time you're on turn four you can boost werewolf pack leader up to seven power so there's no giant payoff here right unlike uh, the list you described with four copies of valky um the best thing you're going to get off fight rigging here is like maybe another collected company maybe a henge on the other hand i mean this is more consistent i think it's just like applying pressure adding pressure to the board so if I look at like where your list diverges, right? this one is prioritizing speed and just like being the aggro every time, where you are going, you are playing Thoughtseize season push instead of the eight elves. Yeah, so we're going to talk about this a lot, but one of the things I try to do when I'm brewing is not build, in my opinion, a worse version of another deck. So I think that a reasonable plan in Mono Green Devotion is to not play the Planeswalker build, is to just build like a beatdown version. Um, and I think that has seen some success over the, over the years of Pioneer. And sometimes you splash black in that list and sometimes you splash blue, right? We call it like a mono green beatdown. I think that all these lists that have this kind of build are maybe better lists than the list I built, but I think there's no reason for these lists to play, um, fight rigging, right? I think, I think that's just a kind of a meme add to a list that we know is pretty good. If you get the right matchups and you're on the play, you know, three or four of your matches, I think lists like this can do fine, but I don't think they have 
uh, different matchup spread, different interactions than just normal mana elf, two and three drop, good green creatures, Coco, maybe Great Hinge. I don't think the the it's changed anything at all. So I agree that this build might even be better than the one that I played. I, I think there's a very reasonable argument to say that it is, but I think it's just worse than an existing version probably that exists. Uh, and I actually played with my list against a mono green deck that was like this without fight rigging that I ended up beating. Uh, that hmm. doesn't mean that my list is better or worse, but I'm just saying that list exists already. And I don't think fight rigging adds anything to the archetype other than encouraging you to play Shakedown Heavy, which is much worse than the, you know, Love Struck Beast or, you know, you, you pick the green three drop that you like, the, the old growth troll. Oh, they have, they have that. Sorry. I wonder what would happen if you just cut the Shakedown Heavies and played Valky instead in this list. Understanding that most of the time you'll have to just play it as a 2-1, but every once in a while the fight rigging will give you the Tybalt. Or like, what if we cut <laughs> fight rigging <laughs> and cut Shakedown <laughs> Heavy and played Love Struck Beast and, you know. <laughs> oh, Love Struck Beast. That's a better card. Yeah. yeah. Okay, put that in. Hmm. All right. Next list up, David, you have something in the green white space. Yeah. So, you know, we talked about this and, and, and it, to be fair, I don't think I even was on this page that like maybe just the front half of fight rigging is just really good if we have a deck built around it. So the first list that we highlighted, uh, you know, like we said two weeks ago, didn't wasn't didn't even have as many payoffs as that list we just looked at. It wasn't playing black. It was just like a mono green list. And, you know, maybe it was just going to hit another big creature, but it won those plus one plus one counters every turn. So I'm proposing a green-white list that is a scales list. So Hardened Scales is a card that saw some play way back yonder when um, you could play Walking Ballista, but Walking Ballista is no more. So we're back to a 4-elf build, uh, or excuse me, 8-elf build, with 4 Hardened Scales. And then our 2 drops are Luminarch, Aspirant, and 4 Conclave Mentor with 2 Voracious Hydra. So we know Voracious Hydra is great, right? If we have a Scales or Conclave Mentor in play, we know Luminarch Aspirant is just a playable card. I've been really impressed by it, like I said, in the uh, Asper Fiend builds. I obviously like it even more if I have a Hardened Scales or Conclave Mentor in play. And then we have Fight Rigging. Fight Rigging giving that plus one, plus one counter is actually insane with these other, you know, counter buff things. And then we have a bunch of other stuff that gives counter. So Nissa Voice of Zendikar, a single uh, Rishkar. Three Vivian Archbow Ranger, two Verderous Gearhulk, one Voron Clex, one Great Henge, four Turn Timber Symbiosis. Uh, I think you pointed out earlier the sort of sweet synergy where you kind of have hidden in your mana slot a bunch of sweet hits. Because we're playing Elves, you don't want to play the um, the Mammoth. So I think the uh, the better MDFC if you're playing an Elf-based uh, version of this deck is Turn Timber Symbiosis. Yeah, I like that full place of Symbiosis here. Just the one Vorinclex. I wonder if we need to play like more Vorinclex. Because <laughs> that was in that original uh, mono green list, like their biggest payoff. They had, I think, two or three copies. Yeah, I mean, have you been impressed by Vorinclex when it's played against you? I've just beaten it too many times. It might just be straight up better than Verdurus Gearhulk, though. It does trample. Um, I guess in my mind, I was like, because of the timing on fight rigging, I guess you still get the haste, but I was just thinking... If you hit a Verderous Gearhulk with whatever, one hardened scales in play, and you have a couple creatures, you get all those counters distributed and, and doubled. Vorinclex doesn't actually add any plus one plus one counters when it comes into play, so it doesn't actually do anything with hardened scales until your whole next turn. Hmm. But maybe I'm wrong. Maybe maybe, it, maybe Vorinclex is just better than Great Henge. Maybe it's better than the third Vivian. Maybe it's better than both Verderous Gearhulks, right? Those are all uh, possibilities. The other thing you could play is some number of Dromoka's Command. I think that card is really good. Um, obviously, it is a plus one, plus one synergy. I don't know that the enchantment thing matters. The removal I chose instead was Voracious Hydra. It might just be that Dromoka's Command is better. I notice you're going with a full eight Elvish Mystics here. Those add speed, but they don't add synergy, right? In ter when you're playing a card like Hardened Scales or Conclave Mentor, you're really gambling that the investment you put into that cardboard is going to pay off with like the rest of your deck just feasting on plus one plus one counters. There's like this trade-off, right? Like if you if you want more plus one plus one counter density, you have to cut the elves. Uh, I see you're prioritizing speed in this configuration, but would you consider like maybe we just want like stone coil serpents instead? Hanger back walkers. Yeah, the problem with all those X spells is they're really bad under your fight rigging, right? So th those aren't fight rigging hits. Uh, also, I do want a lot of bodies to absorb counters from Aspirant and Nissa. 
uh, and Verdurus Gearhulk. So I think I think if you cut the elves, then that leads to a cascading series of choices, which might be correct that you're outlining. Um, but I do think with fight rigging, it's really important to get it down as early as possible because you want those counters as early as possible. Yeah, well, I mean, the elves are not great fight rigging hits either. So I guess it's like this, they're like the luxury slot. But if they're necessary for a deck like this to even compete, then I start to have a little bit of concern. Would you consider like Incubation Druid instead of Elves? Yeah, you have a list here highlighting a uh, Incubation Druid, which I don't think is actually like playable, but it's an interesting idea. Um, I think you highlighted, what is the red green enchantment that adds plus one plus one counters? And you were trying to do all kinds of crazy stuff with Incubation Druid. Invigorating Hot Springs. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, th you know, I think two mana for an O2 that can be targeted is just in a really terrible spot, uh, especially in a deck with no interaction. Hmm. You just can never beat Red Black because they get to stomp it. Um, Incubation Druid is much slower against, um, like, Mono Green. You're not playing Push or Thoughtseize, so you don't have Disruption. So I think you kind of need to lean on some kind of super efficient spell, right? The the list that I, the first list I proposed was turn one push thoughtsies. The the turn one I'm proposing for this list is turn one mana elf. So when you get away from that, you really need to play catch up. We've talked about this, right? Like mm. these grow spiral lists, you really need to be doing something powerful. And Omnath is one of the few things that can kind of catch you up from lost board states. We now don't have. Uh, expressive iteration to counteract the fact that we have to play all these mana sources when we start taking turns off to play big mana type of effects on troop two. So I get nervous when we're talking about, you know, the the dream for incubation druid is you don't do anything on one, you play incubation druid on two, you play rigging on three, and it functionally is a free spell if they didn't kill your druid. And then you need another three drop to play there. Um that's your like nut draw and that's not very good in my mind, I guess is is, is my point. Fair enough. Well, since you mentioned it, let's just take a look at this Incubation Druid list. This comes from Explorer. That's the true to tabletop arena format, but it has a smaller card pool than what is available in Paper Pioneer. I believe this came from a French player whose name escapes me right now, but they played it to pretty high mythic within the last week. They were using that interaction we're talking about, Incubation Druid plus Fight Rigging, to unlock a lot of mana. One way to get around the fail state of fight rigging, like drawing all these ramp cards instead of hiding them away, is like, what if I just have a bunch of ramp in my deck? So that if I draw like a six, seven, or eight mana payoff, it's not just a dead card in my hand, I can maybe actually cast it and win the game that way. So working in that sort of cheating slash ramping space is kind of interesting to me, and I feel like this list somewhat achieves that with Incubation Druid and fight rigging. That being said, they do have to play cards like Shakedown Heavy, Reservoir Kraken, the one we talked about, to enable the fight rigging, and that's not so good. But what really intrigued me was that their payoff of choice was Emergent Ultimatum, which only costs 7, so it's like sort of plausible to imagine myself just ramping up to 7 with my Incubation Druids and my Landwar Elves. Yeah, I mean, Explorer isn't a format, so I don't really know what's going on here. I agree with you, though. Like, if, if you have time to play Incubation Druid, and, I mean, the only plus one plus one counter source they have is Fight Rigging, right? Am, am I missing? Uh, Great Henge, I if guess. You played it, if you played it with Henge, right? So on, on turn five, you, you can play a 1-3 a, a that taps for three mana. You're playing 27 mana sources. You're not playing a lot of ability to manipulate your draw. Um... It's, yeah, man, this, this list looks really tough to me. Uh, I obviously you can't disregard the, the success that it has. I like Emergent Ultimatum as a possible uh, hit. And of course, then the one of Vorinclex makes a lot more sense, right? Because you're going to play Vorinclex with your Curabesta Sea God, right? Uh, with, with your uh, Liliana Dreadhorde General. Um, I just think you need a lot of stuff to go right. And people playing on the ladder every time i watch ladder play it just does not seem like representative of like highly competitive magic yeah i think that's fair the only other copy of this list i saw was someone played it in a mpg melee event to like a one and two finish <laughs> so maybe it still needs a little bit of work i mean you and i have a weird love for incubation druid though so like i'm willing to get suckered in on that i just i need another plus one plus one source other than four flight rigging like that <laughs> What what do you do if you don't draw your fight rigging? Like I just don't understand. And again, 
Pioneer, if you play in a Pioneer League, you're going to play four tier decks in, at least in your list. And if you're doing well, you're going to play five. And those, those people are ready to kill turn one Mana Elf. Like, turn two Incubation Druid is literally dead. Just put it in the graveyard and tap one of their lands and pick a card from their hand at random. Um, so, yeah, I just... If, if it goes right, this looks sweet. I always am down to try out Incubation Druid, but I mean, I think if people play a list like this, they're going to have a bad time in Pioneer. Speaking of Pioneer Leagues, there are two more fight ranking lists that did manage to go 5-0 in actual Pioneer Leagues on Magic Online. They're both different degrees of insane. Like, yes, <laughs> these uh, lists are actually crazy. I was glad you highlighted these. They, these are absolutely wild, but they are in a real format, so I, I choose to believe in them. <laughs> Let's start with the Black Green from Lucas Giggs, who is like a player that, you know, I recognize their name. They they should know better <laughs> than to play something like this. I don't know how they managed to fight with this. This list is insane. It has 12 mana elves, Elvish Mystic, Llanowar Elves, and Gilded Goose. Yes. So we really, really, really want to start off. I mean, every game you imagine you'll start off with the, the mana elf. Yes. What do you do with that? What's your big three drop? It's just the fight riggings. Four fight riggings, two Kiora Behemoth Beckoner. Kiora also profits off creatures with high power. So there's some like cross synergies there, but there's no great hand in this list. Two Rotting Registrar. Yeah, two Rotting Registrar. Not, not four. <laughs> So we only have eight three drops, 12 mana elves, eight three drops. There are four Valky God of Lies. So you can get those as like a fight wreaking payoff. And then there's just like a bunch of crazy expensive creatures. Four Nullhide Ferox, four Massacre Worm, two Noxious Gear Hulk, two Dreadfeast Demon, and three Turn Timber Symbiosis in the mana base. Okay, so let's focus on the positives first. The Turn Timber Symbiosis is a lot better in this list than like the what we would call the more responsible Coco list because we are playing better creatures. <laughs> so that's a positive. Not playing Henge seems insane to me. Not playing more three drop seems insane to me. I don't even think Masker Worm is good against a single deck in the entire format. Um you know, it doesn't kill most spirits, so it's not a good sweeper there. There aren't like white weenie decks. Mono Red, it, you know, has a few creatures, but it's not a very creature heavy deck. It's it's very spell heavy. So I'm not sure what Masker Worm is all about here. It kills a lot of your creatures. <laughs> oh, actually, it only hits the opponents. Oh, it's only, it only hits your creatures. Okay, fine. Yeah, so your, your goose is fine. The goose. So, okay, it doesn't stuff. kill your creatures, but there's really very, very few decks, I think, that Masker Worm punishes. It's not a sweeper, as we think about, at, against literally anything. Like, it's not good against Mono Green. I don't even know what it's good against. It is a shocker to me. I didn't even realize this card was legal in Pioneer. But yeah, there it is. I guess it was reprinted in M21. Um, the sideboard here, they've got like additional options for you to fight Ricking into. They have two Sire of Insanity, two additional Noxious Gearhawks, if the first two in the main deck were not enough, four Distended Mindbenders. This card, uh, it has a cast trigger. So if you fight Ricking off of it, you do get the Distended Mindbender double Thoughtseize effect. But I don't see this card very often, and there's four in the sideboard. I'd also like to point out that their mana base, for reasons that are unclear to me, has a single rogues passage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, four Skylasters, so they acknowledge that Masker Worm doesn't do anything against spirits, so you gotta play four, <laughs> four Skylasher. Skylasher, I've been seeing that more and more in like the mono green sideboards. 2-2 two, two, flash for two, can't be countered, has reach and protection from blue. Interesting card. Yeah, and, and you know, I think it's actually much better than we think in, again, a deck like Fight Rigging, where the counters are constantly getting dumped onto it, and um, if they don't kill it with their red spells early, it can quickly get out of hand. All right, so that is Black Green Massacre Worm <laughs> Fight Rigging by Lucas Giggs. Last list, David. Yeah, this one this one is deep, deep in the tank. So our creature suite is four Ledger Shredder. Obviously, this is a very powerful card, seeing a lot of play in Pioneer and Modern. Four Thing in the Ice, which does have seven power once it's flipped, so that's kind of cool. And the counters you put on it um, stay there, because it doesn't exile itself when it flips. So, you know, if it's a 2-6, it becomes a, a 9-10 or whatever, so it attacks for more, that's fine. Three Hooting Mandrels. 
And then the <laughs> ultimate payoffs are Ulamog and Emrakul. So two Ulamog, the Ceaseless Hunter, and three Emrakul, the Promised End, um, the, the Pioneer Legal Emrakul. And then to support all that, they have Blossoming Defense, which is cool. It protects our creature from removal, gives it a temporary plus two, plus two. Consider opt an otherworldly gaze, you know, help fill the graveyard for your hooting mandrels, turn on your, or flip your th uh, thing in the ice. An otherworldly gaze, I think, is maybe a, you know, EOT otherworldly gaze to make sure your flight rigging hits one of your five, um, you know, big boys. And then for Simic Charm, which again can give you a temporary plus three, plus three bonus, which can turn on your fight rigging, or it can protect a creature. Uh, it, can, it can give he uh, hexproof. And they have one of omniscience, so it's like the sixth, <laughs> I guess, Eldrazi kind of. <laughs> this is just an absolutely wild <laughs> list. They are playing 19 lands. They're not even playing the the four green, 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 um, you know, find a creature from your deck. They're, they're out on that. They don't even want that as a free roll. They're playing a couple of lands that come into play tapped. So they have 19 lands. Temple of Mystery comes into play tapped. They have two of those. Uh... Yeah, this is this is craziness. This is wild. this is insanity. All right, so Thing in the Ice is a good creature that has seven powers. So in order to enable that, I need Considers and Ops. And once I have Considers and Ops, I can play Ledger Shredder. Yes. I can play a Delve spell, but drawing cards doesn't help me because I want to actually like cheat things into play. I don't want to draw my Ulamogs and Emrakuls. So we're we're not drawing cards. We're instead going to delve to play Hooting Mandrels, <laughs> which is only a 4-4. Four, four. It's only a 4-4. Four, four. So then we need to like also additionally, in addition to Hooting Mandrels, buff it with a Blossoming Defense or a Simic Charm. Then we trigger Fight Rigging and get one of our six big payoffs, Emrakul, Ulamog, and Omniscience. But we have the Otherworldly Gaius to go digging for it. Yeah, I mean, I don't hate this list. I don't love everything it's doing. It's playing no interaction. Um, I don't know if you need the omniscience. I guess Civic Charm is also kind of a bounce spell, and maybe you're you're having to do that defensively, you know, at certain points. Yeah, Hooting Mandrels is only a 4-4, but putting plus one plus one counters on trample creatures is actually really good. Once you get it to five toughness, it's actually quite good against red and red black. They don't have that many ways to kill it. Um Yeah, like you said, Thing in the Ice and Ledger Shredder plus eight cantrips is not like you know, that's that's a great start to a deck. The rest of this stuff is so interesting, though. Like, how do you decide on one omniscience? Like, that's that's the number. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the second one is redundant once the first one is yeah. in play. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I, I love I love this list. I love that they five owed with it. I hope they continue to play it. The sideboard has two Stormwing entity. <laughs> <laughs> Kudos to Twistling for the five O. Yeah, super sweet list. All right, have we left any stones unturned? I mean, is there like a hidden fight rigging deck that we just like haven't seen yet in all the cards and synergies we've talked about? I think if people are playing Hooting Mandrels in their fight rigging list, they've started to uncover almost all the... <laughs> <laughs> they've got all the <laughs> angles covered. <laughs> I mean, if I were going to dare to go to Modern, I could much more easily get to the 7 power threshold with cards like Death Shadow with Tarmogoyce, even Shadow of Mortality, maybe just Earth of Saga tokens. I could definitely see myself getting the hideaway trigger in modern, but is that actually worth it? I'm not sure. There are also creatures with, with like variable power and toughness, not just Stone Cold Serpent, but um, cards like Riel the Everwise, uh, Catilda, Dawnheart Martyr, Adeline, Annex. I mean, these are cards that like I've seen them get large. I've seen like the the Soul Sisters concept in Pioneer with Trellisara and Ajani's Primate and Voice of the Bliss get huge. I've seen Scavenging users get huge. Like, are are these somehow gonna like find their way into a package where like they can satisfy the fight rigging? I think the problem with a lot of those cards is they involve another synergy piece to make them big, and so then you can't have fight rigging as well as another synergy piece. Is my thought process? Yeah. Okay. I do want to highlight. A card I was playing in my sideboard, which is Sarulf. Uh, at the beginning of your upkeep, you can choose to remove all plus one plus one counters that are on it and exile all permanents that cost that much. Uh, so that's actually kind of sweet as like a faux sweeper you can hide as a creature that can absorb counters. It can get plus one plus one counters from your opponent's stuff getting destroyed. But uh, like it did sweep away my entire um, 
a Spirits player's board. Like I just, oh, well. It got a plus one, plus one counter on my turn. I attacked. They had to trade. And then on my next turn, they couldn't play anything because I was just sweeping everything with Sir Luth. Now, when you sweep for three, you do get rid of your own fight rating. It's, it's not just your opponent's permanence. But it's kind of a cool little effect to have. Um, yeah, I kind of forgot about the roof. I noticed some like standard fight rigging decks were playing it, but I just didn't. <laughs> I was like, what is going on here? So fight rigging weirdly like enables you to get the engineered explosives for one off the roof, but it also naturally grows. Yeah, exactly. So if you just played fight rigging on turn three and you pumped your two drop or whatever, and then you play Sarulf the next turn, if they have a bunch of ones, it just gets rid of them all if you want. And if not, then, you know, you don't have to remove it. It's just, it's a four, four for three mana. That's fine. Hmm. Okay. Well, I think we've given fight rigging <laughs> a much closer examination than I ever thought we would give it possibly more than it deserves. I'm not sure. <laughs> But I mean, these lists were too sweet to pass up. <laughs> yeah, especially especially the hooting mandrels. <laughs> They're playing your card, gay. So you know you have to be in. Yeah. And you can't. I mean, you don't want to just say it this way, but like sometimes you just get really lucky. You just play your fight rigging. You hit your your Emmer cool, and then you just play like your TI TI and flip it like the the next turn. And it's like you can't ever lose that game, right? <laughs> yeah. All right. So should we shift gears, David? We should. I want to leave fight rigging in the past, but before we go, <laughs> I want to check in on our current monthly project, which is Ginny Fei Jetmere's second. Last week, Emmy and I went through some of the best token makers, the best tokens to upgrade, and we proposed, you know, about six different lists. David, you had some pioneer ones. Emmy and I put some modern ones together. And we got to start chipping away at these. So I played two modern lists just to see if there was any there there. The first one is the one that I talked about on the air. It was the Naya Collected Company Asmo plus Rocco Cabaretti Kitchen. The interaction, of course, being that Rocco coming into play, even with X equals zero, allows you to directly get Asmo and Amarica Dice in the cool car and get a cookbook. You're getting a ton of material. You're getting a ton of power. The cookbook then feeds your token strategy for... Academy Manufacturer for Ginny Fei, and because I'm playing mostly green, I actually opted to go with a gingerbread cabin mana base, so green fetch lands and all forests, instead of playing something like Urza Saga, which is what you would typically expect to find in an Asmo deck. So I took this into a modern league, and my very first match got paired against the Scourge of the Format four color Yorian pile. Just a gigantic pile of overpowered good stuff. So I figured this would be a nice test for the deck, right? Because I've got all these engines. Can I just overpower this value-based elementals deck full of expensive MH2 cards? And the result was, yes, actually I could. I, I got a clean 2-0. I got a bunch of awesome screenshots of the deck just going off. <laughs> Ginny Faye just like summoning a million cats and dogs. With haste, like as turn four, I have nothing in play. I play Ginny, I play a fetch land, crack it for a gingerbread cabin, that's a token. Use the mana from gingerbread cabin to make a gilded goose, that brings another token, and suddenly I've got like two cats attacking with haste, picking off their Teferis. It was awesome. I loved it. So I was like really feeling good about how the engine fit together. The rest of the league was a disaster. I got paired <laughs> against two combo decks next. Uh, one was Charbelcher. The other was not a combo deck per se, but it was Goblins, and they just like naturally drew the combo on turn three and turn four, both games. So it was like, <laughs> my board was like totally irrelevant. So those matchups, like, uh, I hesitate to say, like, I don't want to draw too many conclusions from them because my deck, my main deck was not set up to interact at all with either of those combos. I was just trying to draw sideboard cards and I didn't. So I don't want to like, make too much of that. Setting those aside, the next two matches were like a little more fair back and forth magic. Um, that was against Is It Murktide and the Mono Black Cabal Coffers deck. Against the Coffers deck, now here I thought I would have a good chance of winning the match because much like Four Color Yorian, you know, I'm just trying to impose my will on them, just present more engines, more material, more stuff, more value than they can answer. And that plan mostly worked Except that they had Karn the Great Creator, and they just kept finding it with Profane Tutors and stuff. And eventually I just couldn't kill Karn anymore, and I just had, like, 
eight clues and 12 <laughs> foods and like six treasures just sitting around doing nothing just because academy manufacturer like spits out so much stuff but if there's not like an urza saga construct turning that into lethal damage like the karn just shut it all down it was it was really sad to see so karn got me in both the second and third games yeah that's a bummer i mean these screenshots you literally have like 20 non-game or game objects in play and uh, many of them have blue text saying that they cannot be used <laughs> yeah um i did win one game in that match where like you know end step collected company went from like having almost nothing in play to having you know Ginny plus a bunch of tokens and just like attacking with a million cats on my turn so that was sweet how does Ginny Faye work with Manufactor? Because it's not making a treasure or whatever, it's instead it's making a cat, does it still trigger the Manufactor? Or? It works, yeah. Okay, They're both okay. replacement effects. So you get to choose in which order you want them to happen. So I, you say, I want to do a Manufactor first to triple up on my token. And Got then it. I also want to do Jenny to turn them all into dogs or cats. Okay. So that was nice. Nice. Um, so that was a disappointing loss. And then the final round was against Isaac Merktide, where... I found myself with like not quite enough ways to convert the food into something useful. This was another matchup where not having the Urza Saga made me feel like a little bit underpowered, a little bit vulnerable to just having my action payoffs getting picked off. But I just never drew Jenny in that matchup, and it was interesting. Like I really wanted to draw Jenny there. Um, it would have helped a lot to like, convert all this food into something useful, but I didn't find it often enough, and I just like mulliganed too far in the second game. So that added up to after that promising triumphant win against Yori and Pyle, I ended up losing all four of the remaining rounds. <laughs> but I don't want to make too much of the combo matchups. Um, I think I just need to go back to focusing on like, all right, if I'm playing fair, if I'm playing to the board, trying to interact, like what was successful, what wasn't. The Ginny was good. The Gingerbread Cabins were very good. The Gilded Goose was very good. Manufacturer I did like. I think it would have been better with Urza Saga. Company was so so. Ragavan almost never connected. It made me wonder if I should have just like given that slot to something that was guaranteed to help. And I always wanted more red and six. Um, I only played two in my main deck, and a third one in the sideboard for when I wanted to go for like a Boseju lock. But the truth is, like if you're trying to get gingerbread cabins, you're gonna want a land drop every turn. So the games where I had red and six on turn two just felt so much better. Interesting. So, you know, you don't always have good leagues, but a bad league does not mean it was an unsuccessful league because our goal is to learn about this card, right? That's why it's a month-long project. And it looks like you kind of took a lot of the technology, a lot of your observations, and made it even wilder <laughs> in the classic uh, Dan Schriever process. Brew with even more speculative cards that look, just look super sweet. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, what did I learn? Well, Gingerbread Cabin. Gingerbread Cabin was really good. Yes. I had to go back and think, like, what are my favorite gingerbread cabin ideas? One list that I tried, like, I don't know, it was like a year ago or something, was gingerbread cabin to support Galazeth Prismari. Galazeth Prismari is an is it card, but it's, like, friendly to cast, right? If I'm playing modern, I have fetch lands, I have triomes, I have shocks. I could easily make an all forest mana base that can cast Galazeth Prismari on turn four. And then my gingerbread food can be tapped with Galazeth to cast, like, whatever spell I want. What I found the first time I tried this was that Bring to Light is actually, like, a really exciting payoff when you have Galazeth turning all of your random artifacts into rainbow mana rocks. So I've got four Galazeth, four Bring to Light, four Ren and Six, learning my lesson. I always want to make sure I'm hitting my land drops. Portable Hole becomes my removal of choice because I like having the extra artifact in play for Galazeth. This is a bit of tech that David has developed in Pioneer. I do need some spells beyond Bring to Light, so I'm playing Prismatic Ending, another one that, you know, enjoys having many colors. I actually cast Prismatic Ending for five to kill a Fury. It was kind of nice. Oh my god, that is so sweet. <laughs> <laughs> um, Lightning Bolt, Unholy Heat, one of each, one Glittering Wish, because you will have like a surplus of mana once Galazeth is down. And then I have a bunch of gold cards in the sideboard. What's Ginny doing here? Well, Ginny works with the gingerbread cabins. I'm playing all four gingerbread cabins. Ginny works with Galazeth. Galazeth brings a token. And Ginny also works with Tireless Tracker. So there's like a bit of, like, this is not as much a Ginny deck, but there's like a minor package of token synergy where Tireless Tracker can spit out clues that Galazeth can use. Or it can spit out 
clues that Jenny can convert into something else. Or I can just make clues for value because this is fundamentally a control deck that is happy trading resources and just trying to go one for one. And the final bit of spice is that I wanted like a little more to do with my food. So I've got a single copy of Shape Anew. You can bring to light for Shape Anew. <laughs> Shape Anew can target your food token and get whatever artifact you want. Although it turns out that I forgot that Portable Hole is in the deck. So you shouldn't do this. Like you should not play Portable Hole and Shape Anew in the same deck. <laughs> I literally was like, oh, this is such a sweet tech because you have your battles through here. And that actually makes more tokens. So you can make eight haste power if you have Ginny Faye in play. I was like, that's so sweet. I never would have thought of that. But then you shouldn't be doing it because Portable Hole is so good. <laughs> Yeah, well, I've only played three rounds in the league so far, and Portable Hole, like, has been only so-so. So I'm actually okay, like, cutting the Portable Hole. It's actually side of the Mountain Slum matchups, and I have cast Shape Anew a couple times. The Battle Sphere has done some work. <laughs> it's already won two games. So I have the Battle Sphere triumphantly marching past a 5-7 Ledger Shredder and forcing them to jump with their 5-7 Ledger Shredder. <laughs> I'm 3-0 so far. If these trends continue... We could, we'll get this Ginny Faye Galazas Bring to Light deck in the 5 O's. The, the problem is when people break down lists, of course, they don't think at all, so they just play the same list. And some poor unsuspecting fellow is going to target <laughs> their uh, clue from their tireless tracker or shape anew. They're going to be like, oh, this sweet mirrored <laughs> bastard. They're going to hit portable hole on an empty board and be like, what the hell? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I guess one card I'm interested in, and if I, you know, I'm not, I'm not playing the list, and and this list is so wild. I mean, who's to say what the right or wrong cards are? But it seems like I would want one Niv Mizzet here. Um, if if we end up keeping the four portable holes and we're looking for something to go over the top to like cut a shape a new cut a mere battle sphere, uh, because you actually just randomly have a bunch of hits: Solar Blaze, Galazeth, Expressive Iteration, Ren and Six. Um, yeah, definitely. And before I before I made this into a Ginny Fey deck, the earlier version did have two glittering wishes, and there's a Niv in the sideboard. There's still one Niv in the sideboard. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, um, but I also had one in the main deck previously. Yeah, it's interesting. Like, are there games that can be won with Bring to Light for Niv that cannot be won with Bring to Light for Valky? I mean, the answer to that has shifted over time. I guess it, I'm not sure what the answer is in the current format. Well, and there's also just times when you cast Niv Mizzet. I mean. Yeah, you're 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 playing Gilded Goose, and you can actually glittering wish for Niv Mizzet. Um, you know, if with Galazeth in play, you just tap two artifacts to get Niv Mizzet to your hand, and just hard cast over five mana. That's something you can't do with Valky. Yeah, exactly. So I'm not sure. Like I, I've cited a Niv a couple times. I have the one on the sideboard, and when I take out the glittering wish for game two, um, sometimes Niv has come in, but there's not as many Niv hits as like a typical bring to light Niv deck would have. Yeah, and th that's where it's like, you're really a bring to light list, and Niv is just a powerful thing to hit that still lets you play your, you know, Gigantha. I guess you could always just play more Omnath. I mean, the card is just, can't be that wrong, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, Omnath is like definitely the correct four drop, but, you know, I want to give Galazeth a chance to shine. Sure. And you want to <laughs> shape a new into a portable hole sometimes. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, I really want you to like to to get the five zero. You'll have like two portable holes left in your list and one mere battle sphere. You draw your shape anew, and you have to hit you know a blocker or something. And so <laughs> it's like, all right, this is the screenshot. This is what it's all added up to. Exactly, exactly. So, how have you felt that Ginny Faye is in this list? Are you creating a bunch of tokens with her? Or are you kind of winning like with the Bring to Light package more than more than her? Yeah, I have not like drawn her very much. It took me three rounds to even get her to actually stick a couple times the opponents just like instantly kill her like it hit with a counterspell game one against murktai they just slammed counterspell on jenny Faye. they didn't even want to see what i was doing so that was a <laughs> yeah, bit disappointing because i was gonna i was gonna like get a gingerbread cabin and really you know get an impressive you know <laughs> like just meaningfully pause and wait for them to congratulate me on my synergy but they didn't they just wanted to counter my jenny uh so the jury's still out i mean i feel like the way this deck is built Two Jennies is probably the correct number, if any. Uh, three, I just I put the third copy in because I wanted to like draw it more often. But um, it's a lighter Jenny package here. Yeah, it's a super cool list. Um... <laughs> so stay tuned for the results of, of this leak. We'll let you know how it all turned out next time, <laughs> or just like hit, keep hitting refresh on the five O's. I'm sure it'll show up one of these days. <laughs> 
All right, so that's just a quick check-in on Ginny Fay. We will, of course, be saying more about it as we get more testing in and as we get more feedback from listeners and from people in our Faithless Ruin Discord. So if you've got a Ginny Fay list you've been working on, we would love to see it. Yeah, absolutely. It's nice to see Gilded Goose in play again. Oh, yeah, it's so good with Ginny Fay. I mean, yeah. that was another card held in common between both lists that I tested. I, I love the Goose with Ginny Fay. Brings a token and it can make tokens. Beautiful. All right, we're going to have to call it here. We'll have plenty more to say about Ginny in the coming episodes. And we'll see you next time. All right, take care, sir. Deck lists for this episode can be viewed at our homepage, faithlessbrewing.com. And tune in next week for our testing results. Support for this podcast is provided by brewers like you. If you like what we do, you can join our community at patreon.com slash faithlessbrewing for Discord access, bonus content, and more. That's all for today. Stay safe, and we'll see you next time.